Over the weekend, we learned that a woman by the name of Brittany Gosney murdered her six-year-old son. Son's name was James Hutchinson. And this is not a comfortable story to think through, but there are some very interesting criminal issues that I think are in play, and we are going to go through them. So the outline for this segment is I want to show you a little bit about the background of the story. So obviously a mom murdering her six-year-old son. All of these are still allegations right now. She just had her initial court date yesterday, and so this case has, has a lot of road ahead of it to go down. And what we want to do is just lay out the framework on what happened, then we want to analyze the different laws that she has been charged with, murder and uh, some, some lesser charges about moving a body. The, the sort of the quick and the quick run around here is that they Brittany and her boyfriend, a guy named James, they took her dead son and they disposed of the body in a river. Horrible, gruesome stuff. So we want to break down what happened. But now she's claiming that she doesn't understand what's going on that she's mentally incompetent and that that should be a basis for some sort of escape of criminal liability. And I want to show you how this works. I want to show you the different allegations that are, are sort of floating out there. The first charge that she's facing is murder, but I'm not sure that that is provable at this point in time. And so I want to show you that and then show you some of the lesser included options and what her attorneys are going to be trying to do. Then we're going to look at the competency framework that exists in Ohio. I don't live in Ohio. I don't practice law in Ohio, but they give us a good understanding of how we determine whether somebody is actually competent to, to, to stand trial. They go through a formal proceeding and we're going to wrap up with a nice little memory of her son, James Hutchinson. So Let's go through the story. As I mentioned, a little bit of heavy lifting here, but there are some instructive things that we can learn about the law and about the system and about how these things happen. So let's dig into it. First, learn about this story from David Winter over on Twitter. He said, Brittany Gosney, her boyfriend, James Hamilton, were in court this afternoon. That was yesterday, March 1st. Brittany uh, was charged with murder for allegedly killing her six-year-old son, James Hutchinson. She and Hamilton, which is her boyfriend, are also charged for disposing of the child's body by throwing it into the Ohio River. Just absolutely awful stuff, awful, awful stuff. This is the young man, son, his name is James Hutchinson. And let's clean that up. He is, he died. He was six years old, right? Awful. The story was posted today, 12, 13 AM by Tim L. Frank over at the Washington post. A mom reported her six year old as missing. She'd actually run him over and thrown him in a river police said. And this story uh, we're going to get into it. It says here, just after 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, so this past weekend, Brittany Gosney and her boyfriend walked into a police station in Middletown, Ohio, with disturbing news. Six-year-old son, James, was missing. Middletown police immediately began searching, posting pleas for help and images of the red-haired child in black frame glasses, which is this image right here. Gosney, age 29, her boyfriend, 42, were lying, police said on Monday. In fact, Gosney had run over her son in the park days earlier after trying to abandon him there, according to police. And so pay close attention to that line. She had run over her son in the park days earlier after trying to abandon him there. Then she and Hamilton allegedly threw his body into the Ohio River. And so I want to just pause on this right now. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend these allegations or defend this woman if if it is true that she did do this to her son awful reprehensible behavior i am a criminal defense attorney however and it is important that we understand how the process works that's what we do here is sort of detail and unveil the curtain behind some of this stuff and so what i want to do is just point out a couple things Number one, from this story, and we don't have any of the any of the p formal police documents. I don't have a probable cause statement. I don't have an affidavit, you know, arrest documents or anything like that. We just have the charging documents and some clips that we got from the news proceedings. But the first thing that really stood out to me, we don't know whether she intended to murder him on this particular day at that particular time. Okay, this story says that she had uh, run over her son in a park days earlier after trying to abandon him. So leave him, not murder him. So I'm not real sure where they got this information from, but this is in the Washington Post, which is reputable enough when you're not talking about their political biases. But the point is, we don't know from the facts yet whether this was an intentional murder or what happened when he was run over. More will be revealed. Let's get into it. Gosney was then arrested and charged with murder, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence. Hamilton was charged with abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. Two other children who live with the couple have been removed from the home by the state, the authorities said. On Friday night, two days before Gosney and her boyfriend reported James missing. So take a look at that. Two days before. right? It was a very, very long period of time to report that you're... you're, you're uh, 
son is missing. Police said that Brittany drove him and her two children to Rush Rush to Rush Run Park in nearby Preble County in a parking lot near the boat ramp. She allegedly tried to abandon James. When he tried to get back into the car, she ran over, ran him over, and left the park, according to court documents reviewed by WKRC, which I have not seen yet. Half an hour later, she allegedly returned and found James dead. So was this intentional murder? That's the first question that we're asking ourselves. Was this intentional murder? Okay, because murder, as we've learned on this channel, it requires, uh, in, in most situations, what's called malice aforethought. You sort of, you, you intended to go do what, what you did. And in criminal law, we talk about two components. We talk about mens rea, which is the mental state, guilty mind, culpable mind, somebody who is intending to go do that action. They had that guilty mindset, plus actus reus, which is the action. They have a guilty mind. They do something wrong. That action is the, the active part of the crime. You got to have a guilty mind and guilty acts. So here, did she intend to murder him? Well, she's being charged with murder. So just keep that in mind. Let's listen in or let's, let's, let's look in. We have half an hour later, she allegedly returned and found James dead, put him in the back of her car, drove him home in Middletown. The next night, Burke said, Gosney and Hamilton drove to a bridge over the Ohio River and they threw his body over the edge. When the couple reported James missing on Sunday morning, police were immediately suspicious because that happened on Friday night. It was a little unusual because usually when you have a missing child, the first thing the parents do is contact the police. They said he was missing since Saturday night, but it happened on Friday. Detectives were quickly called in, and within hours, police and Preble County Sheriff's deputies had converged in the park to gather evidence. But Sunday night, police had called off the search. They arrested Hamilton and Gosney, who police said admitted to killing the boy and disposing of his body. Recovery teams began scouring the Ohio River for his remains, work that has been complicated by high water and strong currents. And I saw another article that, unfortunately, right now the boy's body has not been found. On Monday, yesterday, a judge set a $1 million bond for Gosney. In court, Gosney told the judge she had a, quote, learning disability and didn't understand the proceedings, but Burke disputed that claim in his news conference, said she seems to be communicating fine. She understood right from wrong. She understood her constitutional rights, he said. And you see this a lot in court, right? The prosecutor, the judge, everybody goes, yeah, whatever. You understand everything because this happens a lot, actually. People will say, I don't understand. I had no idea what I was doing. And so there is a system in place to get to the bottom of those claims. You can't just go in the court and say, no, I don't understand anything that's going on here and therefore you can't prosecute me. Try harder next time there, judge. It's not how that works. They say, all right, well, all right, we got a procedure, a procedure for this and we're gonna go through a little bit more of that later in this segment. But here is Miss Gosney who is in court. You can hear a little bit of her. This is a clip from a news clipping. So you're gonna see some news and hear some news commentary, but it's over, from local 12 news charged with an unthinkable crime. And here she is sort of here. You can sort of hear her saying to the judge, I don't, I don't understand what's happening. A little bit more framework on this. She is, this is her first court date. So the charges have just been filed. Obviously this happened on Sunday. She got charged. Uh, I think the, the court documents were filed yesterday, Monday, March 1st. Today was the first day she saw the judge. And so at a, typically at a, an initial court date, I don't have the whole proceeding here clipped, but the judge will tell her uh, what you've been charged with. These three counts, they face these maximum, the, the maximum amount in jail, maximum time in prison. You're entitled to a public defender, uh, you know, set release conditions. Typically, somebody would argue for for uh, release. She got a one million dollar bond placed on her. So it's sort of the, the initial stuff. She'll get appointed a public defender if she can't afford to hire an attorney. And the judge just says, OK, that's it. We set a new hearing date. And so at some point in this proceeding, he asks her. Do you understand? You understand what I just said to you? She goes, no, I have no idea. What are you talking about? Here she is. Appointed counsel, ma'am. I don't understand. Brittany Gosney appeared in court today to hear the charges against her. Murder, tampering with evidence, and abuse of a corpse. Well, I have a learning disability, so I'm not understanding what you're saying. We're very confident she understands um, the court procedures and understands her actions. She knows right from wrong. At a press conference today, Middletown's police chief said that after Gosney brought little James' body back home, she and her boyfriend, James Hamilton, also in court today, took the body to the 275 bridge near Lawrenceburg and threw it into the Ohio River. On Sunday, Gosney and Hamilton went to police claiming James was missing. It took just a few hours for a confession. Crews today searching the river for James' body. All, All right, so you know, awful stuff. She's in court saying, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't get it. I don't understand it. We're going to break down how that works. So here's James Hamilton. He also in front of the court 
This guy here, he appears before the judge. He's accused of helping his girlfriend dispose of the body. And here's a little from his clip. Very quiet. Yeah, so you, so you can't hear what the judge is saying, really. He's talking, he's going through an arraignment, telling him what he's being charged with, making sure he understands everything, setting his bond, and uh, that's it, right? So he's going back into custody as well. This is from Brittany's case. So I was able to pull up some of the documents and you can see three charges, violation, one for murder, one for tam tampering with a corpse, one for abusing a corpse. I'm oh, sorry, that was tampering with evidence. The other one is abusing a corpse. Brittany Gosney, three different charges, counts A, B, and C, it looks like. And then when we move over, we can look at some information about what happened. So a lot of activity yesterday. So this is for Brittany's case, only on the murder charge. We're just looking at the murder charge, which is the most serious of the charges, of course. And the complaint was filed yesterday. Case set for an arraignment on March 1st, uh, changed to March 1st at 1.30 p.m. Then they scheduled a preliminary hearing, which is six days from now on March 8th at 1.30 p.m., set a public, def uh, a public defender, and then set a bond at $1 million on murder or all other charges, which is, you know, kind of, kind of, I think, standard. But it's interesting to see it juxtaposed to some of the other cases that we've talked about here. Remember Kyle Rittenhouse, his was a $2 million bond and a prosecutor wanted to make that 2.2 million and that didn't happen, right? And the argument here is, well, Kyle killed more people. So maybe it should be higher. And hers is, well, she killed a seven, six-year-old. Maybe hers should be higher. And so you sort of see how this, how this plays out. This is happening in Middletown, Ohio versus Kenosha, Wisconsin. And so you can sort of play this game uh, around the country, but kind of right on, I would say right, right on track, you know, a million dollars for a murder charge uh, that of course she's not going to be able to pay or raise money to support a release. So she's not going anywhere. More information from her case. You can see she was born 1992. And I wanted to dive in here on this uh, 1992 on this section. So this is the murder charge 2903. She's got a public defender. It looks like we've got a status conference date scheduled on uh, March 8th. So that's coming up. And uh, that's it. Murder charge. So let's take a look at the statute. So 2903.02. This is the murder charge. Murder. And remember when I'm when I was explaining this a little bit earlier, right? We need we need all of the different elements of the underlying crime. So if if Brittany Gosney is going to be convicted of murder, she's got to check all of these boxes. And I want to show you a little bit how these interplay with one another and how her defense attorneys might work to move this down. So think about this from a defense attorney's perspective. They want to drop this down. She's being charged with murder, as we can see here, but there are lesser, you know, less serious violations that might also fit. And so a defense attorney is just going to look at this first charge and say, all right, well, let's see if this fits the facts of the case. If not, we're going to try to move this down. We're going to negotiate the agreement down into something lesser like voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, or even a reckless homicide. So let's see how these all interplay with each other. So first and foremost, murder 2903.02. No person shall purposely cause death of another or the unlawful termination of another person's pregnancy. So we're gonna see a lot of this pregnancy language. They just kind of throw that in there. No person shall cause the death of another as a proximate result of the offenders committing or attempting to commit an offense of violence that is a felony in the first or second degree. So probably not that one. So they, they actually charged her with 20, 2903.02, as we can see right here. So we're in the right statute, 29.03.02. And then we have punishment that's delineated down here. So really what we're talking about is no person shall purposely cause the death of another. So the big question in my mind here is purposely. Did she purposely cause the death of another? These are the elements. Purposely caused what? The death of what? An animal? No, another human being. So those are the four elements. So you can see right out of the gate, you know, if this was a situation like the Washington Post was summarizing for us from the court documents where she dropped him off, you know, abandoned him. She wanted to abandon her child, which is reprehensible. Don't, you know, I'm not trying to excuse that behavior at all. But did she purposefully, purposely cause the death of him? Right. If, if, this, if the situation here was she tried to abandon him so that somebody else could take care of him. She didn't want to do it anymore, whatever. She, you know, she's having a meltdown. You know, she's a psycho person. She really is mentally incompetent. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why that could happen. If you're trying to get to the root cause of it, none of them are excusable or justifiable, but you can help on, you can help you to understand what was taking place here. So if the son, if he is running back towards her vehicle and he gets caught under the vehicle. We just had another situation here in Arizona like that, where there was a guy took his daughter, 
mom went towards the car to get the daughter back. He ran over her. She died. He got arrested. He got booked into jail. Then he died by suicide in jail. Awful situation happening here in Arizona. Sort of similar to this. But the, you know, he did not intend, from, from my reading of the news, to kill her. As she was trying to get back into the vehicle to get her child out, he ran over her, she died. So if that same thing happened here, you can imagine it would be even easier with a six-year-old. If, if mom throws him out of the car, he's running back towards the car, he you know, tries to open the door, gets caught under the wheel, he gets run over, he's dead. Awful, horrendous, I'm not excusing this. But is it intentional murder? Did she purposely kill him? Because that's what the government has to prove, and they have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And if the government fails that, if they charge her with this statute and they can't prove their case beyond that reasonable doubt, if they can't show that she purposely intended, then they're going to lose this charge. And this woman is not going to be convicted. I, don't, I think that's probably a very low likelihood, but just let's, let's go through this again. So this is murder purposely caused the death of another. So are there other potential charges that may also fit that the, that the defense attorneys can try to move towards? So let's look at voluntary manslaughter first. No person while under the influence of sudden passion or in a sudden fit of rage, either of which is brought on by serious provocation occasioned by the victim that is reasonably sufficient to incite the person into using deadly force shall knowingly cause the death of another. Okay, so don't think this one fits, right? I don't think it fits at all, actually, because what is the six-year-old going to do that is going to amount to serious provocation? Anything? I don't think so. Occasioned by the victim that is reasonably sufficient to incite the person into using deadly force. I don't think this, that this one fits at all, so we can just move on right by that. We can also take a look at involuntary manslaughter. No person shall cause the death of another or the unlawful termination of another's pregnancy as a proximate cause of a result of the offenders committing or attempting to commit a felony. So this might actually be closer. Okay, so let's take a look at this again. Let's break this down. No person shall cause the death of another. So you see here what's missing? Purposely, right? It's not purposely. This is the murder charge. No person shall purposely cause the death of another. We go to involuntary manslaughter, not there anymore. No person shall cause the death of another. So what is the intent? What is the guilty mind or what is the the sort of men, the mens rea, the criteria that exists that would justify this charge? And so they're saying that it's, it's basically the proximate result of committing or attempting to commit a felony. So now you don't have to necessarily have intention or a guilty mind in order to cause the death of the person under this statute. But if you did have it for the underlying felony, then we can sort of carry that over into this charge. So in Brittany's case, the hypothetical would be she is committing a felony because she's trying to abandon her child. She did have the intent to abandon her child. That I think is probably without dispute at this point in time. So that was a felony. You can't just drop your kid off in the middle of a park. I would guess I didn't look into the statutes in Ohio, but I would guess that's on the book somewhere over there. So if that's a felony charge and she was committing a felony, she had the intent to commit that felony. Well, what happened is in the commission of that felony, something went wrong. We use this example all the time, sort of in bank robberies, right? The getaway driver didn't intend to cause, uh, you know, somebody to die inside, but they're still held liable for that because they were a part of that underlying conspiracy and, and, and they get the criminal liability as well as the other people who actually went into the bank. So same story here. Something went bad in that bank robbery. The getaway driver is responsible for that bank robbery. Same here. She tried to abandon her child to commit a felony. She left. He tried to get back in the vehicle. She ran him over. That's it. So I think you could, you could make an argument for this charge. You could say, well, it wasn't purposely. She didn't try to run him over, but she did run him over in the commission of a felony. And this would be involuntary manslaughter, which is a totally different charge. Right. Let's take a look here. See if we can glean anything from subsection B. Uh, it says here or a minor misdemeanor code. Okay. So none of that is particularly relevant. The next charge that it could potentially be no person shall recklessly cause the death of another or the unlawful termination of another's pregnancy. So what you would do here is you would look up the word recklessly. You would say, what does that mean? And you would negotiate for that. You would say, nope, she didn't purposely cause the death of another. She recklessly caused the death. And it's a big difference. 
for her guilt. Whoever violates this section is guilty of reckless homicide, a felony in the third degree versus a felony in the first degree. Drop it down levels in severity. So we'll see. We also have negligent homicide, neg hom, we call that. No person shall negligently cause the death of another or the unlawful termination. And if you're, if you're convicted of this, a misdemeanor of the first degree. So now we're dropping it even out of the out of the uh, felony category by means of a deadly weapon or dangerous ordinance as defined of the revised code. So this might apply too. Now that would be a misdemeanor in the first degree, which is way low. So you can see sort of the structure here that they're, that they're delineating for the mens rea, for the mental component of this offense. You have murder, which is purposely. Then you have a lower tier, which is a class three felony. Go to class one. You go a lower tier into recklessly causes the death. Then we drop it down even further. Well, it wasn't reckless, but it was negligent. Drops it down to a misdemeanor. So that's where her defense attorneys are going to be running with this. Now, the claim that we heard about at the beginning where she was saying, I'm not competent. I don't really understand what you're doing or what you're talking about. Let's dive into that because there is a procedure here. You don't just get to go into court and say, well, I, no, I don't remember uh, running over my six-year-old. Don't remember, I don't know, thinking about it for a few days and then throwing his body in the river. Now I'm confused. I was able to do all of those things, but now I'm just confused. Maybe uh, I should be you know, released because I'm just, I have a learning disability. Does that work in court? No, it doesn't. Here's how it works. So the competence to stand trial is defined by Ohio statutes, 29, 45, 38. The issue of a defendant's competence to stand trial, if it's raised, the court, upon conducting a hearing provided in this section, which we're going to jump to next. So 29, 45, 37 of the revised codes. If the court, after this hearing, finds that the defendant is competent, then the defendant shall be proceeded against as provided by law. So this is, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you a framework on this. Here's, here's essentially what, what's happening is she's going to claim that I am not competent to stand trial. I am not capable of understanding the nature, the severity of the charges against me. I cannot understand the proceedings. I can't participate in my own defense. And so when you start talking about, you know, waivers and things, you get knowingly and voluntarily, you got to understand what's happening against, uh, you know, towards you. Because if you, if you don't, then is that really due process? So this happens all the time in criminal law. People say they don't understand it. And so what the court is going to do is they're going to pause the criminal proceeding. They're going to say, all right, you're right. We need to look into this. If you're claiming that you don't understand, then we're going to, have you go and see a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whatever. We're going to go through competency proceedings. You have the normal criminal proceedings that just sort of go down one track. And we're going to say, all right, we're going down this track. We're just going to pause. We're going to take a little bit of a right turn over here. We're going to go determine whether you're competent or not. If you're not competent, then we're going to say, all right, well, what can we do about that? Can we restore you to health? Can we make you competent? Can we you know, give you some drugs, uh, see a psychologist, do some rehab, you know, get off of the drugs, get mentally stable. Okay, fine. We're going to put you in a rehab facility. We're going to have you go through some formal rehabilitation. And when I say rehab, I don't mean like drug rehab. I just mean rehabilitation so that a person who is not competent is now made competent again. And if that is the case, then we just send them right back onto the main road. We send them right back into the trial path where the criminal proceeding picks back up against them and they move forward. What happens if they're not competent? Well, then we have to talk about that. What are long-term solutions there? They may be you know, basically involuntarily committed for the foreseeable future until they become competent again, if that happens. And if they do, then the criminal proceedings would pick up again. And so that's what this framework is uh, detailing here. Let's go through it just very briefly since I just basically explained it. In a criminal court of common pleas, the defense, so the defense attorneys and her team may raise the issue of the defendant's competence to stand trial. If the issue is raised before trial, none of that matters. The court shall conduct the hearing required or authorized under subdivision V within 30 days after the issue is raised. And uh, unless the defendant has already been referred to evaluation, they're going to send her over to a, an independent screener somebody who is a psychologist that is designated by the director of developmental disabilities within 10 days. And so they're going to do a report on intellectual disability. They're going to have a, what's called an intellectual disability evaluation, which is interesting. 
Uh, they, they, they call it something different here. The defendant shall be represented by counsel at the hearing. If the defendant is unable to attend the hearing, then they will appoint counsel. Subsection E is interesting. The prosecutor and the defense may submit evidence on the issue of the defendant's competence to stand trial. A written report of the evaluation of the defendant may be admitted into evidence at the hearing by stipulation. So that means if the prosecutor agrees with the defense and they both want it in the record. But if either the prosecution or the defense objects to the admission, the report may be admitted under different sections or under different statutes or rules. The court shall not find the defendant incompetent to stand trial solely because the defendant is receiving or has received treatment at as a voluntary or involuntary mentally ill patient before. So if she comes back and shows a bunch of records that says, yeah, I, I, yes, I do have a learning disability. I have been found to be mentally ill previously. That alone under Ohio law is not enough, right? They, they need a, a sort of a contemporaneous showing of incompetency. Okay, that may have been a while ago, but what about now? What about here and today? And so the defense can build up their record. The prosecution can build up their record. They'll both submit uh, documents. She will go see a psychologist that's des designated by the developmental disabilities director, and she'll have uh, a screening done. And then at that point in time, that report will go back over to the court. The court will decide whether they're competent or not. If they are competent, if she is found competent, then they can just move forward with the proceeding. And this is interesting. Subsection G, a defendant is presumed to be competent to stand trial. Okay, so the presumption, the starting point is competency. We all start at the competency line. Just claiming it doesn't mean that you get, you get any special privileges. We're going to check. We're going to take a look and make sure that you're competent. If you are, we're going right back to that starting line, not getting any special privileges or any benefits here. If after a hearing, the court finds by a preponderance of the evidence that because of the defendant's present mental condition, the defendant is incapable of understanding the nature and objective of the proceedings against the defendant or of assisting in the defendant's defense, the court shall find the defendant incompetent to stand trial and shall enter an order authorized by 294538 of the revised code which basically is that remediation plan. Okay, if she is found incompetent, they go for a, remedi a remediation plan. They want to restore her to competency. If that's the case, then they can bring this back you know, down, down the road. A couple of interesting points. She's got to understand the nature and the objective of the proceedings. So they're going to ask her a lot of those questions. And there are, there, there are psychologists and psychiatrists that spe you know, specifically practice in this area. They sort of specialize in it. So they can figure out pretty clearly whether you're manipulating or trying to, you know, lean on the lever a little bit too hard. So they'll be able to get to the bottom of it. And the presumption is she's competent. Her defense team, they can show by a preponderance of the evidence, which means they got to have enough evidence to convince a judge that, yeah, it's like 51% more likely than not that she is not competent, which is a tall order, right? She's driving a car. She thought about it help the boyfriend, wrap up the body, throw it in the Ohio River. She has some judgment-making abilities. They went in, talked to the police. She ultimately you know, knew that she got caught. So a lot of decision-making capability there. We'll see where it goes. Now, on a, you know, there's, there's nothing happy about this story. There's nothing high about it. But I just wanted to show you that there is some community support going on there around the home. The memorial has grown markedly at Little James Hutchinson's homes, home. Some of the messaging is anger at a system that can't seem to do enough to end child abuse and neglect. So there is little James. Lot of stuffed animals and roses and little cars. Good stuff. Justice for James. We have how many kids have to die. Help end child abuse. So people are, you know, of course, unhappy about it. Terrible, terrible story, but sort of a lot of, a lot of love is pouring in. So if you're in the area and you want to go, if you're in Middletown, Ohio, and you want to go share some love for a little little James, you can go and do so. It looks like the public is responding. And so we'll all say a little prayer for him tonight. Awful story. We'll see what the government does and, and where this case goes. We'll probably, we'll probably follow the story around for some time. We'll see what happens. Sharon Quidney says, sounds like to me, she might have been trying to punish her son for doing something by threatening to abandon him. Then she accidentally ran over him. So then they didn't know what to do. So they hung onto the corpse until they came up with something where there are drugs or alcohol involved. That would be my bet. Yeah. Very interesting point. And you know, since they waited a couple of days, all, all of that may have dissipated from their system, which I'm not real sure that that is a good thing. I think they may have had a little bit more opportunity 
to uh, you know, to, to investigate this or, or, or even build a defense, you know, they could blame the drugs essentially. And now they can't do that. So NY, NY renal ND says, if true, probably the most cruelest crime I've heard of in a long time. Yeah, it's a very long time. A mother abandoning her child and killing him and then throwing him in a river. Meanwhile, some lawmakers would have us believe that banning guns would present, prevent violent crimes. Food for thought. Yeah, it's a good point, renal. You know, these stories are, are hard to talk about. These are, these are the most difficult stories uh, as a criminal defense attorney, you know, I can I can make cases for defending anybody anywhere at any time. And I can even, you know, sleep well at night knowing that the bigger principles are what I am really fighting for. It's not for bad people doing bad things. It's about the presumption of innocence. It's about due process. It's about going through and making sure that the government, which has the total monopoly on power, that they are doing things correctly. And it, by, by sort of you know, staying on this side of the scale of justice, we keep those things balanced. And if it weren't for a strong, vigorous defense, in my opinion, we would have an overbearing government that crushes civil liberties, crushes some of this, the fundamental protections that make our justice system work, the, the, probably the, the golden rule, which is the presumption of innocence. And so in a situation like this, even though this is the most heinous, you know, it's one, one of the most heinous crimes I've ever, I've ever read about, just cruel inhumanity, your own son, I, you know, it's, it's stuff that you can't even conceptualize, but we got to protect the presumption of innocence. And there's, there's bigger principles at play here. Again, I'm not excusing anything that she did or these allegations, but she still deserves the same due process that all of us deserve. And it's very easy. And, and these cases are the most important cases that deserve a defense because just looking at the headlines, it makes you feel icky even talking about these stories it's like i gotta go take a shower after this segment awful but it's 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 for a bigger cause it's for a deeper fundamental meaning we have a presumption of innocence in this country and we have an obligation and a duty i i, I think it's a sacred duty as defense attorneys to hold the line if if the government has their case and it sounds like they do, it sounds like this is going to be a home run case for them. They've got admissions. They've got evidence. They're going to find the little boy's body. These people are not going to get off on anything, right? But they still have to go through the process. We don't just abandon due process. We don't just abandon the presumption of innocence because we have one very heinous, awful, horrendous, inexcusable, reprehensible crime and, and probably two people who uh, are, are cut from that same category. We still have to protect the foundation of our system. And so that's why we talk about these stories, but it does feel just, it's just the worst. Liberty or death says, have you handled this type of case? So no, I can't say that I have, I have not handled a case where something this egregious has happened. I'm going back through the Rolodex. I've handled some, some gruesome cases involving children, but typically it didn't involve a death. And, uh, they're more sort of sexual assault types of crimes with young people, not as young as six. I don't think I've ever worked on a case with a victim as young as six. It's, it's, uh, you know, thankfully it's far and few between, but it is, it, it, it's gruesome and it makes my, I mean, it makes my stomach turn a little bit, but, but it, it is important that we, I think adhere to the, to the bigger principles of our justice system. Otherwise we lose justice entirely. Hack Consulting says as a prosecutor, how do you take the defensible and make it indefensible? How do you take the defensible and make it indefensible? So as a, as a prosecutor, do you mean maybe as a defense attorney? So in other words, how would I defend this case if it's totally indefensible? Well, so what you do is you just make sure that the government is not is not crossing any lines, right? They still have to go through the formal proceedings. They still have to get the, the warrants and the subpoenas, and they still have to disclose the evidence. And, you know, there's a lot that they have to do to comply with the rules. And that's sort of what I'm a stickler about. You know, they, they, they can't they can't bend the rules around the margins. I know it, it sounds easy to do in this case. They can't do that because the rules, the principles, the constitutional protections that we have, those are eternal. Those are sacred. And we can't just bend those in the cases that we feel uh, particularly uh, gross about because it's convenient to do so. We have. All right. So that's our last question. That is from Hack Consulting.